Greetings, it's me, Luxa from the future. Well, from the past now when you're hearing this. Time is weird like that. Anyway, I'm here to provide some context about what you are about to watch or listen to, as the case may be. This is a video I've made of a presentation I gave on the Green Machine Discord server on May 3rd, 2024. Not everybody was able to make it to that special Fungal Friday chat, obviously, so for those who couldn't be there, here is some of what you missed. I say some because the audio you are about to hear is only me. A, I don't have a good setup for recording things off of Discord, and B, there would have been some issues surrounding legality and consent and stuff since this was a chat that anybody on the server could join, and therefore there was not a way to have everybody agree to be recorded beforehand. So, you'll hear me ask questions and respond here and there to comments that are not part of what you will see or hear. So don't be alarmed when it sounds like I am talking to myself or laughing at things that you didn't hear. I also noticed that I misspoke during the presentation. I should have said that as we construct the path to Void House, we will be consulting rather than collaborating with organizations like Consent Academy and others. I'm looking forward to the Leadership in Consent summer course I'll be taking with Consent Academy starting soon, which is a new development since this was recorded. Also looking forward to some very fun magic, exploring boundaries and limits as we get weird with it this summer and beyond. Lastly, this was a presentation I gave live, so please keep that in mind and forgive my slight awkwardness at public speaking should you notice it arise. Alright, disclaimer's over. Thank you so much for checking this out. Cheers. So I'm really stoked to be getting into this tonight. This is going to be starting out kind of similarly to the presentation that I gave at the very beginning of the Green Mushroom Project. I've kind of taken that slideshow and I haven't changed too much of it, but I did want to kind of gussy it up a little bit. I made it on Google Slides and it looks really ugly and I didn't want to make you guys look at it. So I've imported it into Canva and, and switched, you know, prettied it up a little bit. It, but it's very similar to what we first looked at when we were starting out the Mushroom Project. And then I'm going to be getting into how the new Void House experiment will be a way to sort of like further some of these concepts and further this work and everything. So a lot to get through here, but a lot of it is just pretty pictures to look at as well. So hopefully it won't be too much. Um, I do want to invite people to um, speak up if I say something that is confusing, a word that you don't understand or like haven't had in your lexicon. Um, if I misspeak and you're confused by it, please don't hesitate to, you know, speak up. Okay, so notes on the founding of the Green Mushroom Project. This is by Lux Estrada, and it's the 3rd of May, 2004. The original project slogan was Regain Ground. And I kind of like that for us, honestly. So we're going to be revisiting where we've been and going further tonight. Gratitude to the Void. And a nod to the Tardigrade. <laughs> a very cool animal. <laughs> uh, it, a real inspiration for me in terms of like resilience and all of that. So I uh, wanted to share this piece of visual magic that I made. Okay, so the background of the Mushroom Project. We started this on October 31st, 2020, but I first began to think about all of this stuff a lot earlier. And I did a lot of research and a lot of meditating and a lot of other things, kind of like putting these ideas together. But what was sort of happening at the time with, there was this kind of like, rising tide, like this sort of energetic swell that could be felt by some people, me, myself among them. Um, so a lot of this had to do with, you know, just world events, COVID-19, um, just all of the trauma that came with that um, in a very serious way, just on a lot of different levels, the loss, the social isolation, the adjustments made to people's living situations, just all kinds of stuff that I think people are really still sorting out, honestly. There was, and still is, a lot of social unrest, you know, regarding police brutality. This is a theme which is now, of course, re-emerging here on a domestic scale. And so there's kind of interesting parallels, of course. This is an election year also, so lots of interesting parallels and everything. Um, climate crisis continues. Um, at the time, back in 2020, there was a lot of a anxiety about these new AI technologies that were starting to come out. Um, we saw, G you know, GPT chat, I chat... GPT-3, I always get this one wrong, um, but you know, these things were just kind of starting to like be released to the public and people were 
really not sure what that was going to look like. And I think that's still the case, but now we're a little bit, I don't know. It, it's not, it doesn't seem to be um, as like existential a crisis. It's more of a crisis of like, oh man, am I going to lose my job to this now? <laughs> right? Like, so it's really changed really fast. And then as continues now, the wa- rise of, you know, white supremacy and hate groups um, and, in the U.S. and elsewhere. So these kind of things that were going on, it was something that it's like, well, how can we push against this? I thought like, you know, the energetic resonance or flavor of this tide was very like, almost kind of fascist. Like there was a very like division, confusion and fear. In history, occultists who did work to fight against the energetic currents that the Nazis used thought about this current as being like, male and antichrist in nature. This is something that Dion Fortune talks about in the Battle of Britain. I'm not a huge fan of Dion Fortune like as a person. You know, I think she was very privileged and she had some problematic views like most people of her time and wrote some things that are like pretty shitty about uh other types of of folks, but I do think that this one thing that she did was cool and I thought that that was a cool like, inspiration to take from that. So I contextualized what was going on as being sort of like Mars oriented or like red, if you use Carol's system um, in nature, as well as being something like kind of sterile and prone to sterility. I was thinking a lot about the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, which means fear and panic. So I thought, okay, what would push back against something like this? It would be something that would be sort of its like opposite, its balancing current, right? Something that would be like green, the sort of opposite color of red, you know, Venus opposing Mars and, or sort of being this balancing force to it in a lot of people's conceptualizations of this stuff. Something that would be connective, something that would, you know, be about chillness, finding calm, confronting fear something that would be generative rather than sterile, something like alive, you know. And so that's when the idea of the mushroom came to me. So I approached others about the project and I wanted to share the bibliomancy that I created for the first, that I did for the first slideshow because I think it's kind of funny. I knew this would be a sort of battle, right? Like this was sort of the whole idea of it was like, there's this thing happening. How can we sort of like push against it? But I love what comes up here. So for the people that can't see this, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. The expert in using the military subdues the enemy's force without going to battle, takes the enemy's walled city without launching an attack, and crushes the enemy's state without a protracted war. The best military policy is to attack strategies, the next to attack alliances, the next to attack soldiers, and the worst to assault walled cities. The victorious army only enters battle after having first won the victory while the defeated army seeks victory after having first entered the fray. So that's Sun Tzu from The Art of War. I thought that was really interesting. There's a sort of thing about this kind of passivity here, which fit really well with the current that, or the way that I was thinking about it. We hadn't quite created it yet at that point. So my original to-do list here was quoting Sun Tzu, explain what regrain ground means, um, try my best to explain the ideas about this project, wax poetic about time, and thank everybody for their awesome ideas and interests and support. So hopefully we'll hit all of those bases tonight. So getting into sort of like the symbolism of this green mushroom, right? We've got this fungal metaphor. So there's our basket... Ves- <laughs> We have VAM fungi, which stands for vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae. These are things that form a symbiotic relationship with trees, often consent, like connecting whole forests together through this underground web that you can't really see, but that is very important to all of these organisms. And it's not only a way of, you know, connecting these trees and, you know, this mushroom thing, you know, this mycelia together, It's also a way of exchanging information and resources we're now learning. Um, And the more that we learn about it, the more complex and cool it seems. So this is a kind of metaphor that we're working with with this project of like using this kind of symbiotic relationship is like if we're the trees, then this like mushroom current is this thing that can like, you know, help us connect and share resources and all that stuff in these kind of invisible, unseen ways. So... Fungi are essential for life on Earth here, very important. Most of the time they are saprotrophs, which means that they feed on like dead things or detritus or other things like that. So they're very important parts of, you know, refreshing the ecosystem. They have this, you know, connection to death and life. They're kind of like striding the boundaries of those two things. So they're kind of, they exist in this sort of like liminal space, at least for me as a, as a, a symbol. 
And it's interesting too, because when we look at it from a biological perspective, people aren't really quite sure like where to put fungi. They're kind of like animals, they're kind of like plants, so they're just sort of in their own little like category, a little bit different than how other things do them. Um, and actually vastly different in terms of how genetic information is spread and all kinds of other things. Very, very interesting, but I don't want to get us off track with a biology lecture here because um, we're here to talk about magic. And part of this too is that as a, as a symbol, like fungi are incredibly adaptive and often have, you know, ways of protecting themselves. They can oftentimes produce selective types of poisons that, you know, might either be medicine or, you know, toxic depending on how they're used or what animal eats them. So they, they have this very interesting sort of like medicinal property to them that I worked with magically to sort of like set up some countermeasures to protect this project. I didn't want to, you know, put all of this work into us like making this current if it would just get sort of appropriated by the very people that we're trying to push against. Because what do those people like to do? They love to appropriate other people's symbols and use them for their own shitty purposes. So didn't want that to happen. And also it has a built-in dick joke because it's a mushroom, which, yay. <laughs> so the color green, um, I, I know mentioned the, uh, the connection with like Venus and Carol's silly system. Or the, it's just rebranded planetary magic for people who don't want to think that they're doing planetary magic or whatever. I don't know, whatever. But the classic symbolism is, you know, sort of like safety, growth, luck, creativity, and harmony, like getting into like the sort of color psychology of what green means. We also have it associated with the heart chakra and a lot of conceptualizations of this, which is cool. Um, is, does anybody have any thoughts about the color green that they would like to share? Right on. Okay, so you have people that you're working with visualize this, you know, green landscape. And, and I think that, you know, from a psychological perspective, it does make sense that, you know, this green color would be soothing to us. That indicates that there's plants and plants are what make a lot of our food. So, like, that's probably it indicates, like, safety and stuff in, in some ways, perhaps. So one of the simplest ways to work with the mushroom current is by using the spores. Um, these are just packets of magical energy which can be sent wherever they're needed to do healing and restorative work. They're kind of like micro servitors, if you will, like if you want to think about them that way. But they're basically just these little packets of energy that can go and do as they are directed by the user. We also have the sigil, of course, which is another great way to work with it. It's originally the letters T, G, and M, the green mushroom, um, and it rearranged itself in my mind into this little mushroom shape, which worked out very nicely. There's other things, like we've got the T, it looks kind of like a sword or a cross or gabo. G, it kind of looks like an egg to me or the suggestion of an Ouroboros. The M could be like an Iwas, um, which can be like a horse or a vehicle or also like two people riding beside one another. Some people said like, oh, that reminds me more of like manas, which is like humankind's relationship with the greater whole. But other people will see other stuff. Um, so I'm curious if anybody would like to share anything that they see that I didn't mention. So the sigil is a hypho sigil. Hypho means web in ancient Greek. It's kind of hyper sigil adjacent. I do want to mention that this was very much inspired by the linking sigil the linking sigil that the DKMU did and their work with that thought that it was really interesting and impressive and I'm like okay well be a sort of linking sigil for a different purpose which would be to create this current and to connect us and all that other stuff that it does. It's also a sort of a hyper sigil project on my part. There's some hyper sigil aspects to what we've done and this is sort of iterated out on multiple levels or different orders of magnitude. Part of what we've done here is like encouraging people to use magical technology to become more agentic, which actually I will get to you here. So we've got the sigil attached to this metaphoric symbology to obtain the stated objectives, which are these. So the first one is to create a network of green magic for practitioners to draw upon for healing and restorative works, also cre creative works, which we have accomplished, uh, building and strengthening community and empowering individuals within it. I think we have also accomplished this. Strengthen our position against hate groups and other bullshit through solidarity. I think we've also done this as well. Encourage individuals to use powerful tech to become more agentic, which we have also accomplished. So I think that we've done a really good job of like doing what we set out to do and continuing to do that. And I'm really fucking stoked about it. So we thought that, you know, this 
it's not just going to be like, go, go, go all the time. Like, this isn't a corporation that needs to, like, constantly grow and, like, gobble things up in order to, like, make a board of directors happy. Like, this is more of a, like, living biological metaphor. So we're thinking that it's going to, you know, have lulls and starts and there's going to be, like, planning, initialization, growth, propagation, and rest periods. Like, we'll, we'll kind of see these different stages show up at different points and we shouldn't be alarmed when... There's shifts in like how that energy moves, I think, was one thing that was important to me to think about, because a lot of us are really sort of kind of brainwashed by capitalism into thinking that we always have to be producing. We always have to be go, 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 all this shit. And um, it's not necessarily like you know, necessary to to do that to, to make your goals happen. OK, so getting into the objective one, this is how we sort of like thought about this would how this would go like how are we create this network you know by working with the sigil by doing rituals by doing creative projects with the sigil by sharing it with people websites hashtags all that stuff the community just by doing the project we're sort of accomplishing this uh the weekly work with the sigil on fungal fridays was a big part of like getting this kind of established encouraging people to do creative projects with the sigil and posting them so that we can share and organize Encouraging people to pursue magical and creative endeavors in general and to show support for people's efforts. You know, a kind word can go a long way. Um, we're social creatures, so, you know, just being encouraging of each other's work is something that can be really generative and really helpful. We strengthen our positions against hate groups and other bullshit through solidarity. So this is a problem in the magical community. The flexibility of chaos magic is a really cool way to unite people under a sort of, like, big tent. You know, you can have all these different views about what magic is and who you work with and all of this other stuff and we can still find this common language to talk about that stuff which is really cool and to work together as well and i thought it's not really like good enough to like deflect or reflect all this like stuff like it's or to fight fire with fire like if you if you just hate hate groups like you're just making more hate like it's better to sort of like think about it as more of like a saturnian current of like subtraction or dissolution and that's why i like the idea of the sapotroph here like it's not that it's gonna like attack it it's just that it's gonna like eat it or something <laughs> or if that makes sense <laughs> okay and getting into objective four encouraging individuals to use powerful tech to become more agentic i mentioned hyper sigils they're great because you can do it with a narrative structure but there's all kinds of other things that we've been working with as well we've done some discussions about Aiden Walker's black book technique which is a really cool approach to hyper sigils that I really love and we've got other stuff to be determined like void house is an example of something which has emerged from this objective for so we did a little ritual on Halloween in 2020 called get lit and this was the initial uh sprouting of the mushroom and we have our discord server and this was pretty much the end of the initial presentation that I had because Everything that came after is most of what you all know. Um, but Dave, you were here from the very beginning. Do you have any comments? Like, is there something that I might have forgotten about or like missed or anything like that? Because Dave was a very big part of this. I just want to acknowledge that, you know, his ideas and support were um, yeah, really integral to like, you know, helping me get this shit together and, and share it with you all. Right on. I, you know, actually, I can't see the um, the Discord right now because of, I'm doing the presenter view. Who who is this? I'm I'm excited that you're here. <laughs> this is the statement of resistance here. Resist. Resist by maintaining sovereignty of the self. Resist by maintaining love of the self. Resist by maintaining fierce loyalty to love and pleasure. Resist with acts of radical kindness. Focus on the path to better times. Okay, yeah. so this was something that came to me sort of just fully fo fully formed. Uh, I think I was taking a shower <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's the mushroom thing. It's like, it just happened. So it, yeah, it's one of those kind of things that I'm still sort of unpacking aspects of it, which has been an interesting exercise. So in the meantime, since this presentation was made, we've done some really cool things and accomplished a lot of shit. We've had a bunch of cool online rituals. Oh, more, more examples. <laughs> I told you there'd be lots of pictures. We've had some awesome chats about things, um, presentations. I didn't have any images from the stuff that Laura did for the eclipse this year, but it was so fucking cool. We got, we got so much cool shit going on for the eclipse this year. I'm so stoked about it. And uh, yeah, we've done some awesome like podcast collaborations and stuff. 
and so much more. The, the zine, the mixtape, the Michael Cultus working. We've got our our server, you know, servitor, server servitor, um, the audiophilia project, project specs. There's so much stuff that we've been getting into. So tonight, having laid this groundwork for y'all, for people that sort of like are new or just haven't had all of that put together because I have been meaning to put it together for quite a long time, but just haven't done it. Really excited to talk about cre the creation of Void House. So this is going to be a consent forward space in which we can conduct magical work in person and online. Stuff that's a little bit maybe more serious or like personal than the things that we might do on the server typically. So this is going to be its kind of own area of the server that people can have access to if they want to like participate over there. And we're also going to be investigating some of the alchemical properties of consent through this work, which I think is a really interesting thing. Okay, so Void House, as you can see, or maybe perhaps you can't, there I've chosen in this image of Void House to like include a lot of different types of figures. We've got people of different ages, different abilities, different colors, different species, perhaps. It looks like we've got some people that might not be like human too, so that's cool. But yeah, I wanted to sort of like make this um, very clear that we're hoping that this is going to be a sort of inclusive space. A quick uh, overview of, of what we're going to be getting into here. So the purpose of Void House, it's going to be a space for exploring serious or personal group magical work including experiences which seek to investigate liminality and boundaries in an inclusive, consent-forward context, both in person and online. Another purpose will be to facilitate the creation of scenarios in which boundaries, limits, liminality, and other void states might be explored in an updated, informed, and ethical manner. Okay, so the objectives. There's four of them again. So to create, test, and optimize a template, which can be adapted for multiple purposes and by different groups, but which generally serves in helping to, helping to build an inclusive consent-forward space, which will include education surrounding consent and power dynamics within groups and relationships, and which will outline a code of conduct and social etiquette. So this is kind of like the meat and potatoes of this operation, if you will, is putting together this education program, like, or whatever we want to call it. I'm kind of thinking about calling it the path to Void House, because I think that it will be something that people will be able to adapt in other circumstances, and hopefully they'll be able to take this information out into the world and in their own lives and find more agency through it. So I'm yeah really excited about this aspect of it. To facilitate a space in which visitors to Void House might connect and collaborate and provide opportunities for respectful and inclusive discussion about magic, boundaries, consent, ethics, power dynamics, etc. So this, as I mentioned, is going to be a section of our Discord server. You might have noticed that I'm using the term visitor rather than member. I'm thinking that if we think about ourselves as visitors that go to this place to do a thing, it's possible that we might keep the group dynamic a little bit more healthy and less like in groupy or whatever if we're not thinking about ourselves as being like a club or like a crew or whatever you want to think about it as. But they're all people that can go to this same place and like do this thing if we want to. And maybe we have, you know, souvenirs from visiting there. We might all have the same like t-shirt because we all went there. But that doesn't mean that we're like part of some special group that nobody else can be in or anything like that. I think that there can be places where that can lead to some pretty unhealthy dynamics within the groups that do that. <laughs> What's that? Visitors. Yeah, visitors. So the objectives, number three, to provide educational opportunities to those interested in the use of ecstatic techniques, which facilitate entering altered states of consciousness through pleasure, pain, fear, and other sensations or emotions in an ethical and risk-aware manner. This could be achieved by working with members of the broader kink and magical communities in hosting classes or skill shares. So people sometimes talk about like pain gnosis. You know, I've, I have friends that are like, you know, I like to whip myself into a frenzy before I do magic or whatever. And they don't consider themselves to be kinky people, <laughs> which I find very interesting. <laughs> so like there's a lot of interesting sort of intersections between a lot of this stuff and how people think about it and how they talk about it. And so I'm really hoping that we can just find some kind of common language to communicate and share ideas about this stuff. Okay, so the fourth objective is to continue to update, adapt, and optimize our policies and strategies for crea creating an inclusive consent forward space based on what we learned through experimentation. This is not going to be perfect right out the gate. We're going to have to like optimize and test it and see what works and see what doesn't and experiment. So it's not... It's not ever going to be possible to sort of like top down 
you know, see what works. It's, we're going to have to actually have boots on the ground to figure all of that out. So I really like this idea of our ethos. This is, a, some, this is somebody else's saying that I've adapted for our magical purposes. Ethical and thoughtful, personally responsible, risk-informed, consensual, kink slash magic slash magic slash mysticism. Magic spelled two different ways. Why did I need those three M's? Because this all spells eat prick. Mmm. So we can make space for respectful, honest conversations about the pros and possible pitfalls of using kink or BDSM techniques in a magical context, as well as what these practices have in common with magic in general. Somebody on the server, actually somebody just joined the server and was talking about, I think I might be doing like magic on accident through my kink practice. And I'm like, ah, I've been talking about this, y'all. So I'm excited. So yeah, we can talk about what personal boundaries are. They're kind of like a foreign policy. This honestly, this was something that was a very new concept to me about four years ago. Is like, wait, I can like have these rules about how people interact with me. I don't just have to like do whatever anybody else wants. Ever. Like that was a fucking new concept. <laughs> like it's sad, but like, and I think that that's true for so many people. So I think that, yeah, just kind of having conversations about this stuff allow us to build a lot more of like a robust uh, working relationship with each other and stuff. And we can talk about what informed consent looks like using current thinking. Um, and we can construct guidelines as a means of solidifying expectations and establishing trust with each other. Going to be a sort of updated approach to how things are done. I think our approach to group magic can reflect the age in which we're now living rather than what was done or acceptable in the past decades or centuries. Through intention, attention, respect, communication, and mindfulness, we can construct a scenario which looks more like ecological mutual symbiosis, where all are served, rather than parasitism or predation or other things like that. So I'm thinking about this as being like a sort of consent space and a coercion, coercion culture. Some people call it harsher words than coercion too. So regardless, a consent space within this broader situation that's not so consenty. Before we get into talking about consent though, I'll, actually I should ask, does anybody have any questions or comments about any of what I just shared? Okay, right on. Just wanna mention, sometimes conversations about consent can be a little bit uncomfortable for people, especially if you're not like a kinkster that's like going out to classes about it and shit all the time. Like there's a sort of um, unclarity about what the definition means for a lot of people. And this is something that is still kind of constantly like evolving. Like all other words are kind of always changing their definitions slightly. But like, I think that this confusion can cause a little bit of discomfort. I think that there's some people that are like, oh no, is this going to be a situation where I'm going to be sort of like accused of doing shit in the past or like I'm going to realize something that I did in the past was fucked up or whatever. Like there's all these things that can come into people's heads. So I just wanted to say like before we get into it, like this is about moving forward and not like looking back. Like this is about, you know, talking about what we're wanting to do in the future so that everybody can be on the same page and less confused and less uncomfortable and everybody can feel more chill about the situation when we have these common agreements and stuff in Void House. So yeah, I just wanted to to make sure that people would like, you know, this is this is gonna be about the future, this is you know, or or you know, going forward. We can we can start right now if we want to, right? Um, so I thought it could be helpful to spell out a few things about consent that seem like they need more attention in our broader culture. I'm guessing that there's a lot more than the ones that I listed here, but these are just a couple that I like noticed. The idea, like what, what even is it? Like just the sort of like broad concept. So this is something that I took from an organization called Consent Academy, which is pretty rad. They've got a lot of cool programs. They've done a lot of cool work and we're going to be collaborating with them on some of this shit, which I'm excited about. Um, so the word consent comes from the Latin consentiere, meaning to feel together. So it's mostly about feeling sensations, power, and feeling sensations and power, really complex things, notes the Consent Academy, right? So this is kind of difficult to really untangle, but once we do, it can be really cool. So yeah, how easy is it for you to talk about your feelings, right? How, do you always understand, you know, your, how you're feeling and like what's going on with your body? Do you always know how powerful you are, like, in a situation? Like, maybe sometimes you don't realize that you have, like, a privilege that another person doesn't or something like that, and that can cause, you know, power imbalances and things like that. You know, consent is about slowing down and taking in the bigger picture. You know, it's the Consent Academy, kind of giving yourself space to kind of, like, think about these things and make space for them in your life. One way to understand consent is to consider it as a shared feeling or created thing together through a process of constant collaborative discovery. It's a feeling that comes from voluntary agreement made without coercion between those with decision-making capacity, knowledge, understanding, and autonomy. So it happens when people start 
as equals on the same page. So consent is present in all forms of human interaction, not just sex. Although it, sexual consent is the thing that I think most people are familiar with when they hear this, the term consent. I think most people think about sexual consent because I think a lot of the consent violations that get attention are that in nature, but it's a much bigger topic than just um, sex. So practicing consent creates a space where the safety and agency of all parties is honored. Using a healthy communication and negotiation to craft informed boundaries, consent explicit and implicit is dependent on the context of the situation and can be revoked at any time. So there, we'll get into the difference of, you know, explicit and implicit consent and all of this stuff, like once we get into like the education program, because there's a lot of interesting nuance there that will be useful to look at as we're like, you know, building rituals or whatever we're doing. Okay, so consent versus coercion. I, I mentioned the coercion culture thing earlier. There's this kind of idea about consent, which is that like, no means no. But as Zach Budd from the National Center for Sex, sorry, the Next National Coalition for Sexual Freedom points out in his Five Pillars of Consent talk, um, which you can also hear on my podcast, by the way, he says that you know by the time we get to no means no, someone's consent has already been violated. They've already said no, and the person did the thing anyway, and they had to say no means no, right? Like, th does that make sense to everybody? Cool. It's a good, it's a good place to start, but maybe not doesn't quite get the idea across all the way. So consent and coercion exists on a continuum. The more coercion is present, the less consent is possible. Coercion is more likely to thrive where people have unequal political standing for whatever reason, or unequal access to resources, or people have authority over choices about others. There's also the concept of undue influence, which I would like to get into with Void House, because I do think that it is a big thing in our culture. And I think it was Scriblicious that brought up Trump a few minutes ago, and this is actually very much apropos to the discussion here. Um, and I think that this shows up in a lot of different forms, but where we're seeing it causing a lot of issues in our culture right now is with these political cults. Um, and so I think that by educating ourselves about how this stuff works and, you know, how we can sort of like buttress ourselves against it, it can be a sort of useful tool that perhaps we can take out into the world and help others with as well, which I'm very excited about. And I think it's very much within the ethos of the project here. <laughs> so this is from the American Bar Association. That undue influence is a legal term. Um, it means ex excessive persuasion that causes another person to act or refrain from acting by overcoming that person's free will, and it results in inequity. So that's the legal definition of it. When an individual is able to persuade another's decisions due to their relationship between the two parties, often one of these parties is in a position of power over the other due to an elevated status, higher education, or emotional ties. So here we could think of maybe like a guru or something like that. The more powerful individual uses this advantage to coerce the other individual into making decisions that might not be in their long-term best interest. Thank you, Investatopia. <laughs> Um, so legally, undue influence is an equitable doctrine that involves one person taking advantage of a position of power over another person. This inequity of power between these parties can violate a party's consent as they are unable to freely exercise their independent will. So looking at Cheryl Loverby's consent and coercion continuum arrow, we can kind of see like what this might look like on an interpersonal level. So force being like the all the way to like the coercion bad side of things. It's like, I hate this, but I physically can't fight back. Like you're physically being forced to do something. Coercion is I hate this, but I can't say no. Compliance is where we probably find ourselves with a lot of things in our lives. Uh, you know, <laughs> my, my relationship uh, with consent in many civic capacities is compliance. I don't want to, but I'll do it if you really want me to or you know, to avoid the consequences of not doing it, right? This is compliance. Cooperation. Not really sure, but I suppose it'll be okay. Like, if you're into it, that's cool. Like, I'm, that's not super my thing, but you know what? I'll do it for you, you know? Like, that's cooperation. Consent is like, oh, fuck yeah, let's do it. Let's do it right now, right? Like, you can sort of hear the different scale of that. Is this making sense to everybody? Cool. Does anybody have any, like, thoughts or comments or questions? I know this has been a lot of stuff. Fuck yeah. Yeah, well, fuck yeah, we're going to be getting into more. So if you like this, then you're going to love what we've got coming down the line, because there's a little bit more of this. Okay, so I did mention the idea of the alchemy of consent. 
There's a book by Carolyn Elliott called Existential Kink, which gets into this, which I think is really fun. I, there's a couple people on the server right now that are reading it, which is a fun synchro. It's basically an idea that you can choose to consent to some of the shitty things that are happening to you in your life. And by choosing to consent to it, you can sort of, if you want to, take a sort of masochistic pleasure in it anyway, right? She has this, there's a big asterisk, asterisk that I want to like put on whenever I talk about this stuff. It's like, because one of her main um, like sayings is this thing, like, having is evidence of wanting, right? Like if I have something going on in my life, then on some level, I must be into it, right? And I think that that can be like a really cool and useful thought to apply to your own life. But I think when you start applying it to other people, it can be really fucking problematic. Like it, that person's like it's happening to them because they wanted it to, right? Like I think as soon as you take it away from as, as soon as you take it out of your own individual sphere, I think it's maybe not great. But for yourself, I think it's really cool. Does that make sense to people? Right on. Okay, so Valenti non fit injuria. The Romans are full of fire stings. They really are. <laughs> the things we do consensually don't harm us is what that means. So that's kind of what Carolyn Elliott is talking about there. All right, getting into a little bit of the magical underpinnings here, we talked about the mushroom sigil. This is the sigil for Void Cat, or a sigil that summons Void Cat. Void Cat is a helper and denizen of Void House. It is the house cat. So what does Void Cat offer to us? Uh, to facilitate I, this should say visitor, I, I apologize. Visitor participation in Void House events and activities by leaving visitors gifts of whatever resources are needed, such as time, money, energy, support of any type, whatsoever, in a manner that allows these resources to be incorporated into a person's life in a smooth and non-disruptive manner. To similarly facilitate A, more clear communication and understanding among visitors, B, favorable circumstances for Void House goals, C, the discovery of and solution to potential problematic situations within Void House and protect visitors from predatory, abusive, or other deleterious behaviors. Similarly, to support and aid efforts surrounding A, the preventing of abuse of all types within and adjacent to Void House, B, the establishment and maint maintenance of best practices regarding respecting and protecting the boundaries of all Void House visitors. So yeah, it brings a lot to the table. What is our offer to it? Our experiments will be of interest to Void Cat, who is curious about us and our potential as a group, I am told. We will pay some attention to Void Cat. <laughs> like most cats, Void Cat likes to have attention, sometimes when it wants to. We will recognize and praise Void Cat's gifts when we find them. I don't know how many people here have cats that go outside and, and come inside, but it's not uncommon for cats to, if they like you, to bring you presents, gifts, which is cool. <laughs> Okay, so about the sigil, Void Cat doesn't actually have a sigil. It would be rude to force one because it's sort of of the void in the particular way that it wants to seem to exist, at least based on my interactions with it. There's not like a way to like pin it down with a sigil and still let it maintain its like voidness. But there is this other, this, you know, sigil, which will alert it to your interest and will summon it to you should you choose it to appear. It's made of three C's and three V's, as you can perhaps see. And if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, it does kind of look like a little cat or a little rat kind of looking, looking at you with its little front paws and its little pointy ears. Um, so about the cat as a symbol, I love this Ernest Hemingway quote. A cat has absolute emotional honesty. Human beings, for one reason or another, may hide their feelings, but a cat does not. I, I really love that. <laughs> um, and I like that for like the, the idea of consent and stuff and really being honest about your boundaries and stuff. I think that there could be some things to learn about this emotional honesty that the cat has to offer. So classically, it's associated with protection, mystery, wisdom, guidance, independence. Can anybody else think of things that they associate cats with as a magical symbol or other type of symbol? <laughs> yeah, mischief is good. Yeah. <laughs> Sovereignty. I love that. I've, I've heard a lot of kinksters say that all cats are doms. <laughs> Curiosity. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's right. Tidiness, like a sort of um, meticulousness about what's going on with um, their body, perhaps. Or, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're great at um, this is sort of like why we think that we live together, right? Is, you know, we have the grain stores. They're good at killing the predators of these grain stores. And it's a uh, a sort of cool agreement. They don't seem to like 
have domesticated themselves or like been domesticated the same way that dogs were. They don't have the same, as far as I understand, like structures in their brains that make the types of communication that we do with dogs as possible. So with cats, like each individual cat and individual person will learn their own language with each other. Whereas with dogs, it can be a little bit more universal. Oh, okay. You think the cat teaches you the language? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love that. So I wanted to point out that as we're putting all of this stuff together, we really don't need to like reinvent the wheel. There's all kinds of great resources out there that we're going to be drawing from consulting experts in their fields and the rest. So, you know, we not needing to like do anything new, just really put something really cool together that's specifically tailored for us as magicians. We already have everything that we need to move forward to learn from the mistakes of the past and to create something amazing for the future. So coming soon to Void House, as I mentioned, comprehensive consent education for all participants and anybody else who wants to, even if people don't want to participate, if they just want to do that, that's cool too. A new approach tailored for magic users. We've got a group shadow work circle that we've been testing out and we're going to be launching it in Void House very soon. The next round of the Audiophilia experiment, which I've been conducting, where we're doing solo sex magic rituals towards creating audio tracks for the purposes of restorative and healing work. And also just for fun, too, for some people, whatever you're into, you know. We're going to be doing in-person meetings and much more. And as I said, collaborating with other communities, other magical communities, other kinksters, or other kink, you know, kink communities, other, you know, types of places as we develop best practices regarding consent, inclusivity, and other cool shit. So I know this has been a lot of info. Thank you all so much for hanging out and listening to this very long talk about this very cool project. Um, your time is very much appreciated. And remember, eat prick. Hmm. So, abyssus abyssum invocat. This means deep calls to deep. And here are the sources that I used. You can check that out later if you like. All right, so gratitude. Thank you all so much. Does anybody have questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, ideas? All of it is welcome. <laughs>